What's up, everybody? Welcome into Gramlick and Mac Lane. Super excited for today's episode. Uh, shout out to all of our listeners over on SiriusXM channel 371, the OGs over at Apple Podcasts, and of course, hello, YouTube. It's always great to see you guys. Just wanted to continue and, and give everybody a schedule update. Our show will be releasing on SiriusXM Monday, 2 p.m., and of course, it comes out first, Apple Podcasts. You can see that. I think, KG, about 4 a.m. is when that one comes out, uh, and then same thing for YouTube. So super excited, guys. If you don't have SiriusXM, go get the app. You can listen to it absolutely anywhere. KG, how are you feeling? You okay? You a little rested? You've been on a whirlwind tour. <laughs> I, I'm feeling good. I'm feeling good. I've been able to see some friends lately, which has been amazing. And Mac, I just had a first. It's very rare that you do something for the first time when you are 28, almost 29 years old. But for the first time ever, I went to Disney. And it was amazing. I had never been, my dad was, and my dad's the best dad ever, but he was also like, we're not going to Disney World. Like, <laughs> I can't even imagine my father taking us to Disney World. That would have been just not even funny. So I went with some friends, some OG college friends who Mac knows from our Clemson days. Shout out Kristen and Karis. And we also, <laughs> Kristen has two kids now. So it was basically like 2011, <laughs> but with these two kids that weirdly kept following us around. Like, who are you guys? And we took, by we, I mean, I didn't do most of the work. We took a two-month-old to Disney and just, I mean, Kristen nailed it. I just have so much respect, so much respect. And shout out to our employer, one of our employers, Mac, because it made me feel so good that I was able to use my Disney employee status yes. to get the, how many of us were, including the kids, the you got six everybody of us in, in for free. Wow. Yeah, it was awesome. You know what I've done with that? So shout out I, to I that. don't want to steal your thunder here or take away from your story. I have never used my passes. I've always like given them to other employees mm -hmm. in ESPN. I've never used them for myself. So I don't know if I have any left. I need to try to experience this. You probably do. I hadn't either. And I thought, oh, let me just try. And <laughs> it, worked, it was so easy. It worked so well. And, and you can even hop with them. You know, you can, we went to Epcot and then you can go to Animal Kingdom, whatever. So yeah, it was great. We met many. We met many. Did and you get a picture? Did you get a picture? It was a big Big time. Okay, we did, we'll pop yeah. that up. We'll use some the, magic the and pop that up right now. We'll show many on YouTube if you're watching. Um, okay, what what was yep. your favorite? I mean, this is your first time. You're 29, 28, and you've never been to Disney. Yeah. What was your favorite? Well, <laughs> I only got to go to Epcot because my flight was at 5 o'clock. So, <laughs> I know. So when I are we going go back. back to Disney? <laughs> but Epcot, oh, I'm ready. We could do a Graham Lincoln McLean from oh, Disney. Okay, be let's amazing. do it. Epcot was really cool though, because I'm not a huge roller coaster rides person. We did some rides for again those random kids that were following us around. But <laughs> for the two we, they did Epcot they did rides really for the cool. two month old. <laughs> yeah. These two little kids that looked a lot like my friend and her husband, they just kept following us around. It was odd. But I thought all I mean Epcot was amazing and we just walked around to all the different places. I ate in Italy. Um, I also ate a little bit in the American place, but then I, you know, we went what, to Mexico, which was on. a lot what of fun. What was it? What was that? The it American place? What is American? It was just the middle of Epcot is like the American. Yeah, what was it? Like chili, chili and they cheese have barbecue. Fries. Like what was it? <laughs> no, actually, they have barbecue and they had a low country oil. Okay, boil okay. Going that, on. I like that. I like yeah. that. I was like, all right, this is, and that line okay. was short. So I, went over there, I have but... to, I have to follow up on something yeah. else because you said you don't like roller yes, of coasters. Course. Um, that that's kind of weird. I don't. Uh, second, have you ever I'm, been to somewhere with I'm roller coasters? Like what what theme parks have we actually been to? Yes, uh, Six Flags pretty good over Texas. We went in high school, and I you, basically just you rode the Ferris wheel. Is that what you just, were to tell me? That's it. I mean, I rode like one or two, and I was like, "This is awful." So I just uh, tried to win the basketball oh, games so and, and won so stuffed typical. animals. So if, it, if it's not at the, the <laughs> giant Texas State Fair, Kelly's not doing it. That, that's basically what it comes down to. Yeah, I'm just a wet Mac. I just don't, you know, as I'm married to an engineer, so I understand engineers are good at their jobs, but I just don't trust something that's going to, like, spin me upside down 100 feet in the air. Just, I'm not doing that. Just, I'm just, just live that's a little. That's not for me. Okay, just live a little. Not that's all me. I got to say. Can we talk about our guest? Who's coming on with us today? Yes, <laughs> let's get to our guest. Let's get to our guest. We have... Sports media 
royalty joining the pod today. Basically, like the the mini of sports media, the mini mouse. Nicole Auerbach is a senior writer for The Athletic, and she has been covering college football and basketball nationally since 2011. She was named the NSMA National Sports Writer of the Year in 2020. That is a huge deal. She Mac. is amazing. And it was so fun to talk to her, guys. She also does TV. She also does radio on SiriusXM. She's all over the place. College football studio analyst for the Big Ten Network. Before joining The Athletic, she wrote for USA Today, Wait till you hear these stories. It's, it's absolutely crazy to kind of hear her oh. rise and, and kind of the preparation of what happened to how she got there, as well as many other publications. Go follow her on Twitter. She's great uh, on that social media platform, at Nicole Auerbach. But before we get into any of that other stuff, let's talk to Nicole. Welcoming in Nicole Auerbach to the show. We are so honored to have you here, Nicole. And I just awkwardly did this intro where I'm saying, okay, I'm going to ask you this first question. It's going to be funny. So let's see if it is. It turns out you and I have something in common. Maybe we both peaked in high school. You were recently honored with the Outstanding Young Alumni Award from Princeton Day School. I just did a bunch of high school stuff. Now, I did tell the kids when I was giving a little speech that I was actually very grateful I wasn't that cool in high school. So I'm just curious. Obviously, neither of us really did peak in high school. What was that award like for you? And uh, what was high school like? I'm just curious after you got that award. Okay, well, if you're saying that you were not cool in high school, then we are very similar um, (laughs) because that's great. And also love setting up a joke because, you know, you're you're trying to force a laugh. Absolutely. Um, So it was actually super strange. Um, I don't know if you guys have had this experience of like going back to high school, but I hadn't been since my brother and my sister both graduated from there. It's a prep school. So it was, um, you know, like a half hour away from the town we grew up in. It was obviously in Princeton, New Jersey. And it was like a really small graduating class, like 80 people, um, which was very small for our area. I would have probably graduated with like 700 if I went to public Mm -hmm. school. And I was just, it was so competitive and it was really a high pressure place. Like there was so much pressure to go to Ivy League schools and like early decision day was like a bloodbath. Like it was this whole (laughs) really crazy academic environment. And they also didn't care about sports that much. It was actually weird going back. They built this whole new like athletic complex. And I was like, oh my God. What is that? We didn't even get... We didn't have varsity jackets and like rings. I mean, wow. all the, the basic stuff that I really wanted out of my college, my high school athletic experience. Um, so like I played softball. We won a prep title there, but it was, nice. you know, it was really, it was really hard. And, and there just wasn't a ton of athletes that went on to do other things. Like my brother's teammate um, and friend at school was Davon Reed, who played basketball at Miami. Mm. But that was like the first athlete like of that caliber in a really long time like a girl in my class went and played squash at harvard so like you're like that type of school so it was squash, just strange. Oh squash. our high schools were very was, different nicole <laughs> they were very different but my point is um you know we were like really like theater was a strong suit and and all of these these things and um but there wasn't a ton of interest in the things i cared about like softball so um yeah. you know it was just very like just a tough academic environment. And I, you know, I kept up with uh, a couple of friends, but, you know, it was just, it, it was a very like hard period of life. Um, and, you know, I was trying to figure out, you know, what did I want to do? And, you know, to do it in kind of a fishbowl and small school, like that's part of the reason I ended up at Michigan, as you guys understand, mm. like the big state school environment, you can be anonymous at times. You can yeah. figure out who you are and what you want to be. And that was really helpful for me. But I, again, it was kind of like the opposite of that experience. So when I was invited back, it was really interesting because, you know, you're trying to, like, I kept thinking about what about that experience, you know, led me into sports journalism because I didn't write for this, the student paper. I didn't do any of that at that time. But I had a couple of teachers at that school, um, Mrs. Walker and Mr. Sanderson, who were like the first teachers in my life Shout who out. ever treated me like an adult and just supported whatever creative avenues and ventures you wanted to do. One was my English teacher. So obviously I ended up in writing, but I also did mock trial with those two Mm -hmm. teachers. And that was again, like a spur of the moment thing. I had no interest in being a lawyer or like anything, but now looking back, it's like, oh yeah, that was like all public speaking and having to like really own this persona. I was a witness in there in the whole deal. It was this whole (laughs) thing. 
And um, one of my teachers who ran mock trial was my English teacher, Mrs. Walker, came to the award and she like made a joke because the joke was about it was like a E. coli outbreak. So all the names were like Sal Manella, you know, like all the characters. Oh, my. <laughs> and so she starts making all these jokes. This is like bringing back all of these memories. Um, but, you know, it was one of those things where I was like, what really jumps out from that experience? And it was these teachers that like actually treated you like an adult for the first time when you're like 15 and that's all you want. And um, I still keep in touch with them. And like they, again, I didn't know what I wanted to do when I was around them. But there's something about being like supported by those teachers to fail or to try different things. And that was one of the things I was thinking back about because I was like, nope, we didn't really like, we weren't amazing at sports. I didn't write for the student newspaper. Like a lot of these things kind of <laughs> fell, I fell into at Michigan, but that the teachers and kind of some of the framework around trying things that I might not be good at. That was what jumped out at me, but it was so weird to be back and just, it is it, weird. I'm 15 years out of high school and feels like it hasn't been that long. And also just was like, just totally bizarre to be back in, in those halls. <laughs> I, I love that. that. That's so cool. And, and really you're, you're helping write our story right here, our script right here as, as we're going along. So obviously you like sports, you, you've done it for quite some time at a young age and, and things of that nature, but it sounds like there wasn't a ton of support in high school, as you just said, but let, let's check our research department here in middle school. Uh, what, is it true that you were asking for a Peyton Manning Jersey for Christmas? Is that true? Yes. Yes. Okay. So, so obviously go, go ahead and tell us about that. First of all. Yes. So everyone, and I'm sure Kelly gets this a lot too, because I think, um, you know, we still have these like outdated gender ideas that like, at some point, someone had to teach you sports or something like you couldn't just naturally love sports. Um, so I played a lot of sports, but people like to ask, you know, when did it kind of go from playing softball and tennis and basketball to like following it? And, and I agree that that's that is a totally different thing. But for me, it really was related to Peyton Manning. So my dad is a jet season ticket holder which has been very painful for so my sorry. entire <laughs> life. But and he's, and he's still, yeah, and he still has tickets. Oh, and, wow. but like, so we'd go and there would be like football 101 things for women that, that like, he'd give me the books, we'd go to stuff. But basically I just went to games and learned the sport that way. Right. And, you know, so this is like the Chad Pennington era, I had Chad Pennington jerseys. But my dad is also, like, not the best sports fan in the sense that he will root for teams that you're not supposed to root for, both of them. <laughs> so he also liked the Giants, which, again, like, you're not supposed whoa, to whoa. like the Giants and the Jets. Right. He also would root – like, we were more Yankees fans, but, like, he would also want the Mets to be good. And he'd say <laughs> that it was – so that, like, you could have a Subway series. Like, it would be meaningful yeah. if they played each other. Sure. I understand but, that. I don't know. It was a little bit of, like, front running and, like, rooting for teams that you're not supposed to root for. <laughs> Uh, at the same time. But so, so he sort of like, we obviously followed the Giants as well, but he also, we liked Eli Manning. Um, we would host Super Bowl parties. And so when the Giants were in the postseason, I mean, like, we, we again, we're very familiar with them, even though we would have said we were Jets fans. So naturally that goes into, oh, well, we also love Peyton Manning. And then <laughs> I just like loved Peyton Moore as a quarterback. I loved the Good Audibles. Decision. I loved everything. Good yeah. Absolutely. Colts were so fun to watch and they were emerging. So they were putting them as like the Monday night game, the Sunday night game. Like they were in all these, you know, prime time slots. And so naturally we would watch my dad and I became huge Peyton fans. And so we eventually went from only watching the Jets or going to the Jets games to just watching football all day on Sunday, Monday night football, Thursday night football, like all the time. And so I feel like that was when it goes from being a sport, something you you play and something you do to being like a full blown obsession. And that's when I started getting invited into like fantasy football leagues and stuff yes. in like middle, middle yes. school into high school. Were, were you a bigger question? Were you winning those leagues? I, I did back yeah. in those days I did. Yeah. And, and now I don't know if you guys have this experience, but people still invite me to them. And I'm like, guys, I am checking out on Sundays. I am like fried <laughs> from football from 11 mm -hmm. to 2 AM. Like, I don't know who's good or who's right. going to like give me points. So I only do a fantasy league with some of my athletic coworkers. We're all college football writers, so we all overvalue right, right, right. great college oh, players right. who like yeah. absolutely are not going to put up a bunch of points, but we're you know have like bidding wars on like our favorite college players and then they'll get do nothing in the NFL, but right. we're still like happy we have them on right, our team. Right. My, my biggest thing with fantasy is I, I do a little research, I see who's consistent on these different things. 
and I always lose. Like, I'll start my team. I'm like, this is awesome. I'm going to kill y'all dead last. I finished last twice with my friends. So I'm never playing ever again. So I have never, to this day, have never That's played. Pretty bad. It's because That's of injuries. Bad. Like it's just crazy. Sure. It's, it was so it's wild. because you don't know football. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. That's exactly. That's very true. All right. So you talk about <laughs> liking sports. You talk about being obsessed with sports. When did you decide you wanted to cover sports for a living? Uh, because it sounds like there was a little bit of, of maybe a transition that occurred there. Yeah, so uh, uh, coming out of high school, I, I didn't really know what I wanted to do, but I was actually very math and science-y. So I even debated applying as an like to engineering programs. <laughs> Can I just uh, put I, pause real quick? Yeah. So I did engineering, and then I did science, and here we both are doing sports. We, <laughs> not, we should not have communication. Not using that at all. It's not unbelievable. At all. I did it's tell. unbelievable. I had a great college experience. It was, you're the, you're it was the smart there one. There we go. You're the smart well, one. Well, all right, go ahead. I'm sorry. Here's an even, even crazier one. Um, so my high school, again, I told you, like, really good at arts and stuff. So they had, like, a ceramic studio. So we had, like, all these, these experiences in arts. I took architecture for three years thought about going into architecture and then decided not to, even though I really enjoyed it because I didn't want to be like in a studio underground all of <laughs> college. Saturdays, I, like, I want to have yeah. a more normal, yeah, a more normal experience. So I thought I was going to go to the business school or be an econ major because my dad ran his own business. And what ended up happening was I was moving in to my dorm freshman year. I'm talking to a girl across the hall who is a sophomore we're talking about our dream jobs, and she says that her dream job is to be a heart surgeon. She's going to be pre-med. She ended up doing all of this. She went to med school. She, like, saves lives, all of the good stuff. And I had a much less noble proclamation. I said I would want to work for Sports Illustrated. I read it cover to cover every week. But I hadn't made the connection that, like, regular people got to do that, that the, those were normal jobs that people could aspire to. Not normal, but, like, sort of normal. They were yeah. at least accessible. And she said, you should join the Michigan Daily student newspaper. My best friend works in the news staff. And I was impressionable. This is welcome week. I am worried I'm not going to make friends. I'm so many miles away from home. So I said, okay, sure. Like she gets me the sports emails editor and I find out when the first meeting is and I go. But did I know that that was what I was going to do? Absolutely not. Was I any good? No. My first story was about... Club Ultimate Frisbee, I had no idea what I was doing, what to ask people, how to write a story. I mean, all of that was just like came by doing and making friends and sticking around. But I always tell this story because it's wild as you, 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 know, you never know like what sport you're going to end up covering or like which beats and different things. When you start out, it's sort of like what jobs were open when you're applying for jobs. And my first game at Michigan was the day before my first meeting at the student paper. And the first game was App State beating Michigan. Wow. So, I thought you were about to say App State. That's crazy. That was my first college football game because wow. I grew up pro sports. I went to Jets games. We never went to Rutgers. I was 20 minutes from Rutgers. Never went. Wow. That was my first college football game. And now I'm what? a national college football writer. Like you wow. could not draw that up. My first meeting at the student paper was the next day. They tear up all of these features <laughs> and all these special stories they had about Mike Hart, Chad Henney, Jake Long coming yeah. back to play for a national championship, all this stuff. Right. And they just that was the a, expectation, right? It was that's like, why they came back. Yeah. yeah, it was the, yeah. the season before was the 1 2 game in the Ohio State game. Yeah. So, and then it was the worst four year stretch of Michigan football history, the four years I was there, wins, loss records. You had that game, then they get blitzed by Oregon. <laughs> what? <laughs> then the three years of Rich Rod, most losses over a four year stretch wow. of Michigan football history. Wow. And, I was just intrigued. I'm watching these seniors writing this story of like what the hell happened at the right. state. And I'm like, oh wow, they like can write that. They're authorities. Like they know what they're talking about. And it was just really fascinating to me. And so I, I didn't know that it was something that I I could do or want to do as my career. Probably until the summer after my freshman year, I interned at the Trentonian in Trenton, New Jersey. And I was, that's when I was like, it was every day, right? So they're sending you places and you're writing on deadline every day. I covered a lot of little league baseball and softball. Mm -hmm. It was very big, the 12 and under group. The softball team I covered actually went all the way to the little league world series in softball that year. Um, but you know, so you'd cover like two games, try to interview 12 year olds, very good learning experience, <laughs> very hard to get usable quotes. I did like double a baseball, the Yankees minor league team, drag racing a three second car race really again a good challenge to figure out how do you write about human interest angles to write about something that 
is three seconds as a race. Um, so it was like my first time doing it every single day. And I realized that I liked it. I realized that the challenge of showing up to a press box and not knowing what was going to happen was exhilarating and writing on deadline, getting better at that, getting a great quote. And it was also, you know, the first experience of like, this is nights and weekends. I'm going to miss stuff. But I didn't really have that FOMO with all my friends who were just hanging out. And that's when I was like, okay, this is one of those jobs where if I do it and I do it well, it doesn't feel like work on good days. And so it kind of went from there when it was just like some of these jobs, I think you need to experience them and experience mm -hmm. the schedule and the lifestyle. And then you can see, you know, is this for you or are you better off just staying a sports fan and just, you know, buying Peyton Manning jerseys? <laughs> that is very well said. And Look, the fact that your first game you ever covered, even attended, was App State, Michigan, I feel like this was just the path. It had to go this way because the drama, the underdog, the crazy, one of the craziest games in college football history, boom, this is where you go. And I, I absolutely love that. And by the way, I, we're saying this in your intro, but I, I want to make sure people understand that we're talking with the 2020 NSMA National Sports Writer of the Year, okay? The fact that you have gotten to this point there's a reason why your high school has you outstanding young alumni, okay? So the fact that you've gotten this point Kelly, it's in... because it's because I'm young. That's what. <laughs> well, hey, that helps. They, told, they said I'm young. It counts. Did you? That's the other thing. When I was at my high school this past week, I just felt so old. Oh, man, it was rough. But anyway, so you've gotten this far so quickly. And for a lot of people, it might not happen as quickly for them. What, what do you think happened for you that made it like this? Like, is it, was it just, you worked your butt off and, and you got some good breaks or like, what's your advice there? Cause I followed your career and I've just wondered like, bam, I mean, she's just risen like that. So how would you explain it? Well, it's funny that you asked it that way because there was a time when, um, in my first job, people would be like, so I get these emails from college students being like, so what shortcuts did you take to like get this job and whatever? Shortcuts. And I'm like, shortcuts? Yeah, like I just found some loophole, right? right. And like that's, you know, and someone just was like, here, handing you a job. Um, you know, so like one thing that, again, I, I think this is true of, you know, everyone who works really hard in, in what they do is like a lot of it you don't see, right? So, um, you know, throughout college, I freelanced a lot and I, you know, was really, really focused on internships. And like, that is a huge thing in, in a lot of businesses, but especially in sports writing, because there's just not that many. So I would like a couple years, I actually went home for, for fall break so that I could lock myself in my dad's office with a printer and a scanner <laughs> and print out the articles that I wanted to send as my clips, like the way that they ran in the paper um, and not just like copy and paste into a Word document. And I was also putting little notes next to each one about why I picked it, because I wow. think that one of the things a lot of people do when they're sending clips is you're just, you pick them for a reason, but you never are explaining why. So one of them, for example, when I was applying for internships for my senior year, where I ended up working at the Boston Globe, I had interned at USA Today, stayed in touch with these editors, became friends with some of them, and Denard Robinson blew up on the scene. So in like a span of three hours, they called me and they were like, do you think you could turn around like a Denard Robinson cover story for USA Today? Like, cause I'd, I'd worked for them. I'd written cover stories before, but they were like, we can have someone feed, you know, Urban Meyer quotes about Denard from here and someone else can feed this and whatever. And you can just kind of like, who is he? How did he get here? It was actually a really cool moment too, because one of the photos that they used was a Michigan Daily photog had had amazing kind of like a Heisman pose photo of Denard. And it, we, we were like, dude, this photo is amazing after the game. And we got it on the wire. So it ended up being on the AP wire. So what was really cool was that USA Today cover story was written by me with a photo from one of the Michigan Daily photographers. So we like kind of put it up on the, on the Michigan Daily wall. But it was wow. like a three-hour turnaround. And obviously it ran. And I, so I include this. And I put a little note explaining, you know, like they had called me, asked me to turn it around. And, and I did. And I found out later, and this is also something I would say, talk to the people who hired you and ask them why, right? So you can learn something. And my editor, Joe Sullivan at the Boston Globe said, I remember reading that story in USA Today. I had no idea a current college student wrote it. And so he, basically that clip got me that internship because, and in part because he read why 
right? The, the backstory of that, that particular story. Um, one of my other favorite clips was, like, I would always include one from the student newspaper. It's less polished, right? Like, it's not a professional editor. And I did a story on Troy Woolfolk, who was a cornerback, who got hurt right, right at the start of the season or the camp. And most of the time when we read stories about injured players, it's the year after. And everything's great. And, you know, you can kind of breeze through some of the rehab parts. But I ended up spending a lot of time with him while he was injured that season. Like we went to Benny's, which is this great diner in Ann Arbor. You know, we spent some time, did it obviously around the SIDs who, you know, at the end were like, mm, Nicole, did you? Like, I was like, well, we connected on Twitter. It's fine. You know, whatever it was. But it was this like really, I think, insightful look at the loneliness and isolation while going through an injury. So dealing with all of the physical stuff and, and watching like the muscles in his leg, you know, get weaker and weaker. But also just like people stop calling and people you just you're, you're out of sight. You're not around your team. And I've always thought about that ever since writing that story. Every single time I talk to someone who's dealt with a major injury because it was just so raw because we were talking during that period of time. And so ended up writing this this big feature about him and about his story and also about what that's like and how this position was somewhere that Rich Rod felt like this was going to be a strength of their defense. Obviously, you remember those defenses were not very good. They were having to win games like 65-63, and it fell apart when you lose one of your best players. So it was like this whole kind of like macro look at the program, but look at him through the prism of this injury. And it's one of my, my favorite stories that I've ever done because I just don't think people look at athletes in that state. We forget about them. And then we revisit them when they're when they're back. And just to go through it while he was going through it, I think, was really interesting. So I've also been told from different editors that that story jumped out, too, because, A, it wasn't edited by a professional editor, but the access and the idea to do it was very different. And so, um, you know, so I would I would try to do stuff like that for the student newspaper. But I, I was a stringer for the Detroit Free Press. I freelanced. Bowl, pre, bowl pre, pre bowl stories for mm -hmm. they were playing Mississippi State one year, and so I wrote for like the Northeast Mississippi newspaper. Um, my senior year, I freelanced for Sports Illustrated. Uh, ESPN had a high school site at that time. The Wall Street Journal wrote a big story about like the future of college hockey. So I just really busted my ass to get yeah. writing opportunities. And I cold emailed people. I reached out to people. Twitter was in, in much more of its infancy. And so it, you know, I kind of used it as like this living, breathing resume thing where, so when I pitched Sports Illustrated, you know, Stuart Mandel and Andy Staples, who are now my coworkers, went to their editor and they said, we've been reading her work for a while. Like, let her do this. It was, you know, it was a story about um, one of the current players on the team, Elliot Mealers, was in this awful car accident on Christmas Eve that killed his um, his father and his girlfriend and his brother was paralyzed and given a 1% chance that he'd ever walk again. And so the brother was rehabbing and, and was going to eventually like, get back to the point where they thought he could walk with, the, you know, walk the team out under that banner, the Go Blue banner. And so that was the story. And it was about them and this this tragedy and, and Elliot and his mom and all these people. And um, it was incredibly hard to report, which, again, I think these are all good lessons because it's about talking to people and figuring out how you can be um, someone they trust really soon after, you know, they go from stranger to like, can you talk about like the worst thing that's ever happened to you? It takes a lot about to to be that interviewer, to be in that situation um, and, and to speed up that trust process that they feel comfortable. So that story ended up running on Sports Illustrated as a bonus story. So I, I did all of this stuff in, in college. I, you know, again, I was I was making sure that my applications and my website and everything was current. I was spending all this time. I was blocking off weekends. I was going home for fall break to make sure that I was doing all of this um, as authentically as possible as things ran. And, you know, I was fortunate enough to, to land internships. So I interned at the Trentonian after my freshman year. The Cape Cod Times uh, for my sophomore year, which was pretty awesome. So a lot of like the baseball stars, Chris Sale, those guys were all playing in the Cape League that summer. Um, then I interned at USA Today and covered pretty much everything, a ton of baseball, um, the NBA draft, some, some major events for them. And then after graduation, I interned at the Boston Globe, which was kind of my dream job, my dream internship all along. They had such a great reputation, track record of writers that had gone through there. 
And they did so much from a development standpoint as well. So after I was wrapping up there, I was looking for jobs and I was applying all over. Um, and I, I flew to Oklahoma for a job interview. I was interviewing to cover high school sports in New Jersey, a lot of different things. And USA Today had an opening for a digital editor for college basketball. So it was a foot in the door job. Um, it was like posting other people's stories photo galleries. I had to teach myself how to do some HTML coding because I had to do like our bubble watch and bubble tracker. Um, But obviously, you know, it's not the dream job. And that was also a good lesson, I think, too, that like the first job is never going to be the dream job. But it was, you know, ultimately, I wanted to get my foot back in the door. I knew so many people who worked there. And I had advocates there that had even told me about the job in the first place. And one of my first like real journalism experiences was like three weeks after starting they bring in all this new senior level management and it's a restructuring. And we get through this whole process where every single person in the sports section had to reapply for their job, even if you had it for 20 years, but you could also apply for something else. So I was able to reply, apply for college basketball reporting position. And really that's where it all began in terms of what I do now. Um, I was 23 and I got that job. So all of a sudden I was, traveling, you know, 100 days a year, covering college basketball nationally. And then I added college football responsibilities, Mm -hmm. covered two Olympics. Like I was adding on to different things and then joined the athletic in 2017 and flipped to do more college football. But it it, it was a wild ride. And a lot of people, you know, especially starting your career at like a national magazine, a newspaper, people would say like, you know, how did you do that? And it's like, well, you don't know how much I worked to get so many clips in in college and to have all of those experiences and stay in touch with all of those editors so that I had those opportunities where my resume could say that I wrote for the Wall Street Journal and Sports Illustrated and ESPN and all these things before I was even applying for a full-time job. I mean, so it, it was fascinating to see that other people were just sort of like, oh, you know, how did that how did that fall into your lap when again in all of these and, and we cover these athletes and there's just so much put in where no one sees it. And then you're like, oh, and now they're a better passer this year. And it's like, well, you, how many hours went into that? And so it's kind of the same process. And, you know, the people I know who succeed in this field are the people who work so hard and put in all of that time and energy when no one's really watching or early in their career to send thank you notes or all the different little things um, that ultimately show up in a bigger way. But they build that network. They build that reputation. So then later on, people take chances on you. Wow. Okay. I think every college student needs to go listen to that. I mean, maybe just beyond college students, but especially if you want to get into journalism. And Nicole, I love, because I would say this is even my tendency. If someone were to ask me that question, I probably would have deflected and I would have said, I just got really lucky and I met the right people at the right time or whatever. But the fact that you detailed exactly what you did to get to that point. And I like how you compared it to an athlete. Like you put in the work, behind the scenes, you went to the gym and put up extra shots in in the media style, in the journalism style. And that was just, that was really inspiring. And I hope that people can watch that and see that. It's it's that it's it's that quote that I always loved that is like the harder I work, the luckier I seem to get. Yeah. Because you do need luck. You know, you do need certain things to open up at certain times or someone to think of you or someone to 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 vouch for you. But you can also put yourself in a position that you're prepared for when that lucky opportunity comes about. And I think that there's lots of times where, you know, people get put into positions that maybe they're not prepared for. And I never wanted that to be me. I always wanted to be ready to meet the moment when that moment came, which again, you're hoping that it will, you don't know that it will, um, but you're working and working and working and, and you feel like you're gaining, you know, all of this experience that someday something will happen. And I was entering the profession. I graduated in 2011 and so many people were saying, are you really sure you want to go into this field? Like there's no jobs, everything is shrinking, but I felt it and saw it that the people I knew who worked hard were getting jobs Mm -hmm. and were having opportunities. So, you know, it wasn't the easiest profession to go into, but the ones who, who really worked hard um, and wanted to do it for the storytelling and the relationships and not just because they wanted to go to the cool sporting event of the week. Yeah. <laughs> Those are the people who stuck. No, I always say this. I'm like, if you like sports, keep it as a hobby. You have to get into this stuff because you care about people, relationships, telling other people's stories, communicating. 
those are the things that are going to keep you going because you're going to lose your fandom. You're going to like hate right. that you're going to have to miss someone's wedding on a Saturday. Right. So that stuff is also really important too. But you know, the people I know like yourselves who really care about the people are the people who succeed in this space. I love that, man. That that was that was really fun. Just to be able to kind of unplug for a second and just listen as a fan, um, that was really cool. And I, and I love what you said about you know the, the harder I work, the lucky I get. You know, I, I think it's it's just so true that when opportunity and, and preparation meet, crazy things can happen. And, and I love that. And I think all three of us we we've kind of approached our careers that way. And you know, Nicole, obviously it's led to some really cool things for you with, with writing, with reporting, with TV, radio, and, and doing all of these different outlets. Um, you've been able to really be in and, and cover the craziness that is college football right now. I mean, th this landscape, you said you graduated in 11. We graduated in, in 14, 15. It, it is very much different from then. You know, I, I think when I was hired, I was like the, the new kid on the block. Yeah, tell us what the locker room's like. And that's all way different now. So just from your perspective, I mean, it's in a crazy state. But, you know, what what are, you know, your thoughts on where college football is right now? Well, it's definitely in a period of transition. We just don't know exactly what it's going to look like um, two years, <laughs> five years, ten years from now. Like, if there's... There's different administrators where I'm like, oh, if you could just fast forward five years and know what it was going to be, would you do it? And there's lots of people who would say yes. But just going back to, you know, this preparation, just in case there's younger listeners who are interested in this stuff. Ten years ago, my editor's like, why don't you go to an NCAA convention? Like they might be doing some stuff and then transfer rules, but it's good to go. You can meet ADs. You can meet different people. And Red is barking. Superstar of the Red show. Has, Red has... <laughs> okay, he's being a guard. Bark. Bring him up. Bring him up. Let's wait, see. Wait, 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 wait. Oh, he's, is there someone... Is someone breaking in? Is your dog he's, named Red Arbok? Yes, he is. He is. Uh, there are two new puppies. Now. That is I will, I will. Once amazing. he's back, once he's back, he's he's protecting me right what now from the puppies down what the block. What a legend. That is it's so good. amazing. Um, he's also very athletic, so, you know. Does he like cigars? He ended up... He, he's... <laughs> He's got like he's got a toy cigar. I'll Stop send you guys it. the photo. Oh my god! He also um, we're gonna need the he's photo. He's got like we're a need four foot vertical. Like it. Come here. Wow. Oh my gosh. Okay, bunnies. Reds, reds, reds being a little gonna, shy. Yeah, hang reds on. Being a little shy. Hey, oh, red. Oh, look at him. What's up, red? <laughs> what a legend, Nicole. You are a legend <laughs> for naming your dog that. That is amazing. When I googled you the other day when I was doing some research, one of the, I'm sure you know this. One of the first questions is, is Nicole Arbach related to Red Arbach? <laughs> I got asked it almost hourly when I lived in Boston really? that summer, oh, and I Boston, came up with a yeah. pretty pretty good answer. And it was just, you know, it's really personal. I don't really want to get into it. <laughs> Smart. Yeah, keep some um, mystery. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, so, so going back to this, so yeah, I cover this question. NCAA convention. I start, you know, when I'm going to different campuses, like to talk to coaches, I would also talk to athletic directors and all these things and then continue to build those relationships. So even when I switched over from covering basketball, like I still talk to people who are in basketball only conferences and different levels of division one. And all of that comes and pays off when, you know, the entire enterprise is, is blowing up and changing or COVID's here and no one knows, you know, are you going to play? When are you going to play? What are the rules? What are the protocols? And I have people at all different levels and all different parts of the country that I can check in with. And so that's been really helpful now as well, because people have different opinions on what should happen or, you know, what athlete compensation can look like, should look like, what legally, what they think the environment is. Um, so it's really important to talk to people who have all different perspectives and backgrounds. I think that, you know, obviously I think we're moving more and more towards an eventually an employer employee relationship. I think even some of the issues around NIL and the way that, um, you know, some of the issues with like recruiting inducements, whatever, if you have a direct payment system set up from a school to the athlete and you don't have third parties and you don't have, you know, these other elements of it and you have, you know, let's say a player's union or some sort of bargaining union uh, unit, some of that stuff goes away. It becomes simpler. It becomes a lot more straightforward and, and more fair. Um, but like there's, there's multiple steps that we'll need to take to ultimately get there. I think a lot of people are tracking on different legal challenges. Like there was the case 
that was originally brought by a former Villanova football player, right? Like, so there's, there's areas where people are following and tracking, but you're not really sure like where the dam's going to break. And that's, I think, where college sports is right now, where like we know that there's change. We know that there's internal pressure from this Division I transformation committee to reform the model, figure out what Division I looks like, minimums. Um, what do you do with football governance? Is that part of it? Is it its own kind of separate thing? You know, how do you keep who, who's under the big tent together? But then also you have these external pressures like the Supreme Court ruling and other legal challenges federal pressure um, because you haven't acted on NIL in so long that it became like a popular bipartisan issue, yeah, which it is actually shocking. brought Republicans this, and Democrats correct, yeah. together <laughs> right now when they cannot agree on anything, they can, which what's the after. only thing that can do that sports, oh, that's yeah. sports. It. always going against the NCAA. <laughs> so yeah. again, it's like, you know, that, that things are going to change, but what and where, um, yeah. and that's really, that's really the question. So, well, is- let me let me ask you this. Let me ask you this. Ten years, just yes or no. Ten years, where where will there be either a super conference or a new division that's like forty teams? Yes or no. Ten years. I don't know. I can't answer that. I, I that's uh, the time boring. frame. Is, I know it's boring, <laughs> but the time frame thing is just the tough one. I mean, like, yeah. what happens if if in two years there is kind of like a football can govern itself and do its own rules, then is there as as much pressure to create like what you're describing, a super league of just like the top of the top? Um, You know, I don't know what, what happens is we see the effects of these, this next round of media negotiations and some separation. We don't know yet. So sorry, I'm being boring, but I don't, I I can't predict that (laughs) far out. If I had a crystal ball, I would be, um, Maybe in the running to be like the next NCAA Wait, president. You don't have one? I thought you had one. <laughs> I would love to have one. Magic <laughs> ball. This is this is how we know Nicole is a legitimate journalist, not like us. Because <laughs> she says, Look, this is the information I have and That's I don't right. know. Whereas That's you right. and I would just pontificate for like ten minutes and probably be wrong. Um, hey, I went to Clemson. What does pontificate mean? What is that? Well, I went there too, Mac, and I learned that word. Okay, so let's talk about the ACC in general here. This is an ACC football podcast, and we're going to do some ACC rapid fire here at the end. But And we asked this to Gojo. I thought his answer was interesting. In your, in your opinion, Nicole, I know you live in the Midwest. You're a Michigan girl, so you have a good perspective of just you're not in this Southeast bubble like a lot of people um, that I interact with. So where is the ACC? In college football as a whole, if you put it in tiers compared to other leagues, where do you see the ACC right now? Um, I think it's in a very, I, w- I want to say precarious, but that's like a little bit too dramatic uh, of a spot because everyone's waiting to see what happens with Clemson, right? Like, is this mm-hmm. the drop off or was last year an aberration and then they regain this? I was just talking to someone else earlier about the coordinators leaving and waiting to see what the impact of that is because that was such a major thorough line of those college football playoff teams was the fact that you had the same coordinators and Alabama was switching out and there was so much staff turnover and Clemson didn't have that. Um, So what, what does that look like? What does it look like in a world where when Dabo talks about the transfer portal and NIL, it feels like it's like five years ago and everyone else has adapted to the idea that if you have a hole in your roster, you can plug it almost immediately with the portal, what happens if Clemson never does that? I mean, like you're going to have rebuild periods that are not reloading like other top programs have. But, you know, I'm also one of these people, you know, I love the ACC Coastal. I mean, I know we're going to soon get rid of it and not be able to call it that. But like, RIP. I love the depth in the ACC. I think that it often gets overshadowed or like talked down upon. I thought that like the 2021 season and not having Clemson in the championship game was actually two incredible stories. I think yeah. that what Pitt has done, what Wake has done, I'm really excited to see North Carolina State this year, very high on Devin Leary, just profiled him. There's so many great stories and there was also so many great quarterbacks in this league and everyone just says, well, if Clemson's bad, everyone else must be bad. Right, exactly. And I don't like that. And, um, you know, like I get... I also go to bat for Rutgers. I grew up 20 minutes from there. And when they have these moments of like breaking through or something, I cover them and people are like, oh, it's, you know, you're just making fun of Rutgers. And I'm like, no, these programs matter to people. 
And people are allowed to have their highlights and they're allowed to have these moments, even if they're not competing for national championships. Right. And so I think that a lot of that gets lost in, in this era of college football playoff or bust. And I think that it's, it's not great for the other teams in the ACC to just get painted with such a broad brush because you can have great seasons. You can accomplish a lot of other things without a making the playoff or, you know, if, if, you know, let's say Clemson does and you still do other things. It just, I, I, I kind of hate that about where college football is right now because, you know, what Pitt did was incredible and it broke, you know, there was history made and Kenny Pickett, you know, is all over the history books. He never transferred. Like there was just so many lessons and things and interesting stories from that team or from how Wake did this to get to an ACC championship game, Wake Forest. And we just, there were all these people just being like, oh, no one's going to watch that game. I'm like, I am. I'm very excited for it. I think there's <laughs> right. compelling reasons to watch this and be excited yeah. about it. But I think nationally, you know, it's certainly not the Pac-12. The Pac-12 has got their own issue of just like the the public perception of them. Um, and I, I think, you know, Clemson has obviously carried a lot of weight for the ACC in non-conference games, right? Early season games, but also those postseason games to set different narratives. I, I do think, you know, in an eventual expanded playoff world, there needs to be more depth. You need to get multiple teams and it can't be Clemson in a massive drop off or, you know, whatever it is. But I just think it's so lazy to, to talk about the ACC as like Clemson and everybody else, because right. they're, they're incredible stories and quarterbacks specifically defenses, coaches. I mean, there's just so many interesting things, but we're in this era of football where it's like championship or bust. And even if it's an ACC championship, but Clemson's not in the title game, it, it doesn't matter as much. Um, I just, yeah. I just kind of hate that. So I, maybe I'm an outlier there in terms of like the way that I watch football or view success for seasons, but I like watching the ACC. I talk about it on Sirius XM radio. Like these coaches are really great. I think there's a lot of really interesting and insightful voices in this league um, so I'm not going to ever write a conference off the way that some others right. do. Well, I, I appreciate that. Number one, the follow up kind of to that, that I, I, I've always thought about this and Kelly, you know, she really spelled it out in a tweet a couple of days ago with, when you look at Ohio state and you look at Clemson, very similar records in the past 10 years, whatever it was, five years, whatever the, this thing was, but I never hear about it's Ohio state pulling up and picking up the big 10. I only hear it for Clemson. Why is that perception in in your mind that the the Big Ten is is so dominant, and, but Ohio State can just run through it? But guess what? Up until a year ago, every time Clemson Ohio State played, Clemson won. So I, I don't know why there was that weird stigma of this is only applicable to the ACC, not the Big Ten as well. Well, this is isn't this the way that all of this stuff works? Where if the <laughs> SEC's top team loses. It's because, like, if Alabama loses to Tennessee, it's because Tennessee's better than expected, not that maybe Alabama was overrated, right? Like, there's just certain perceptions, and Big Ten fans will get on you about the way that the SEC is talked about, right, versus sure. the way that they are. Because they will tell you that the Big Ten gets, you know, gets a lot of crap for can't the speed and the size and the athleticism, losing to Clemson, whatever it is. Like, oh, you can get to the playoff, but, you know, they've gotten – shut out in the playoff or whatever it is. Or the Big 12 fans will say, well, people still think we don't have defense. And they do. <laughs> yeah, like Oklahoma State's right. defense last year was really, was really good. It's why Ohio State hired their coordinator. But these 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 narratives get are so hard to flip. Um, I would say that probably the biggest answer or the first thing that comes to mind saying that specifically between Ohio State and Clemson is the Big Ten has had a lot of teams finish – in the five to 10 range in the playoff rankings. They've had a number of teams kind of knocking at the door or the, the, the second place team in the East or whatever it is, is like right outside of that. So they're going to good bowl games. Um, they're, they're in high profile matchups. They had high profile games during the season with Ohio State, but there is that perception of that depth behind Ohio State. And when you do the numbers of, oh, if we had a 12 team playoff, you know, how many big 10 teams and SEC teams there's a reason that those two leagues have the most because they do have a lot of teams that finish right outside of that top four. And so that just changes the way that you think about the regular season, the level of competition for Ohio State throughout the season to get there, even if the narrative coming out of those games is, oh, look at that gap between them and Penn State. Look at that gap between them and Michigan until last year. 
that's that's always what would happen. But I think people would believe that those were challenges, that those were tests, and they were just still head and shoulders above that. So it's about that 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 second tier. It, it doesn't have to be the uppermost echelon, but it's that tier right behind it within these leagues. And this is what, you know, we, I know we've had a lot of these ACC coaches make this point that the brand name matters, right? Like if Miami has the Absolutely. season that Wake did, yeah. then do we right. talk about that very differently? They're top five. I mean, there's no question. Florida State, right? Yeah. yeah. So yeah. it takes time for mm-hmm. even that stuff to catch up and then change right. perceptions about how you view these teams and then how you view that that tier right behind Clemson. So I, I, I understand that the ACC audience would be frustrated with this, but I guarantee you it, Big Ten fans – get the same thing and they will say the SEC gets all of this credit and we right. never do. And we right. never, you know, <laughs> except they do. I mean, that's true. That's and they true. do. That's and true. they do. Yeah. But so everyone's got that where there's something that people ding you for every single time. Right. And it's really hard to change that narrative. No question. No question. No, and, I agree. and I loved your point too, about the, the tier two, like that, that needs to be solidified in yeah. the ACC. It doesn't need to be a revolving door of a random team every other year. Like it needs to be, NC State. It needs to be Pitt. It needs to be Miami. Florida Whoever State. Florida State, like <laughs> stay there. It needs to be someone that can stay there, and then eventually, you know, play in the number one area for a while. So we'll see. It, it, it'll be really interesting. It's it's kind of the it's it's a little bit um, related to like what the Pac-12 is dealing with, and when people talk about USC needs to be good, like they need right. their flagship programs. Right. USC and Oregon could be good. Well, Clemson's had a flagship program. Well, the ACC's had a flagship program, but it needs beyond that. And so like they're two different issues, but similar sides of the same coin. I would also just throw in there too, that the ACC needs to do better in the non-conference. I mean, the biggest issue with Pittsburgh last year was they lost to Western freaking Michigan. Come on, If they hadn't, they would legitimately be in the playoff discussion. And Wake Forest played no one in the non-con. This is, this is the exact argument that we learned in in basketball season. Yeah. ACC is a horrible non-conference basketball season. And then now you have these coaches saying, see, we were better than you thought. Like, look how many teams how we got. How are we supposed to know? <laughs> exactly. There's, there's a reason that that's considered like one season, then conference play, and then the postseason. They're different. They're, they measure different things. But how else are you supposed to know when you're right. trying to compare relative strength of different leagues and, and how many leagues are going to get how many teams in when you play that poorly against weak non-conference teams? It wasn't just anyone. So it's the same thing. Like, that stuff is very important, and that was also a Pac-12 thing, right? Like, they would have that one marquee game, and, like, Washington would lose to Auburn, and it would just be like, whoop, the yeah, Pac-12 is wiped out, out of the playoff. <laughs> right. So all this stuff really matters. Again, it's like perception matters, especially when you have, like, a subjective selection committee deciding right. these things. But we're exactly. also we're talking about national perceptions and fans. Like, all of that stuff plays into it, so you have to win those non-conference games. And it, it's just so weird thinking back to, like, the first game of last season. Like, Clemson didn't play Georgia that badly. That was the best team that they no. played, ultimately, right, all regular yeah. season. But it changed the way that we talked about both of those teams all season long. So there is such an outsized impact of those non-conference games. Yeah. No no question. And the ACC has a great opportunity early and at the end of the year to make statements, you know, because of those non-con games and going cross-conference and things like that. So, all right, we're wrapping up right here, Nicole. Really appreciate your time. This has been so much fun. We're going to do a little rapid fire. Uh, and, and I just, you know, get ready. Here we go. So I, I need to know, number one, quarterback. There's a ton of guys. It's a deep, deep league. I want to know your number one quarterback going into this year. In the ACC, right, well, by the way, we're talking well, ACC. Well, I'm, I'm gonna stick. I'm gonna stick with my guy Devin Leary. I just wrote three thousand five hundred words about him. Um, <laughs> he is the only quarterback in ACC history to throw thirty five touchdowns to just five interceptions. Like Trevor never did that. These guys didn't do this. Um, I think that if that team is poised to do what they can do, he's gonna have a monster year. But they're gonna have to throw it a lot. I mean, yeah. if you're if you're breaking in different guys in the offensive line and running back, you're gonna be throwing the ball a lot. So um, I think it's gonna be Devin Leary. I think he's like the guy who's gonna take like a Kenny Pickett kind of jump where he becomes much more of a household name by the end of the season. Two guests in a row have echoed what I think. I love that. It's, it's got to be solidified. I'm right there with you. I think that's a a great pick. All right, let's move to to teams now. The Coastal, your favorite division in all of college football. It is. Who's going to come out on top in the Coastal Division? I still think it's going to be Pitt again. Um, obviously, you know, we have all were waiting for that Jordan Addison news to be finalized. I have them for state of the program, so I've been going through their roster. 
regardless, um, I, I still think they have a lot of skilled players. They've got some great running backs. The defensive front is so good year in and year out. Like it's just such a, such a constant. And it's funny because you talk to Narduzzi, obviously a defensive guy and they had to win games like outscoring teams last year. And he's not (laughs) particularly (laughs) comfortable. No, he absolutely hated it. We had him on serious uh, XM and it was like leading into the championship game. And I mentioned the over under of the, the title game. And he was like, and I was like, are you comfortable winning games like in the 50s? Like you're a defensive guy. And he goes, oh, yeah, look at, you know, if I win by one point, I'm, I'm fine with sure. it. And then he just circles back and he goes, what was the over-under again? <laughs> and then he starts going into launch and like, our defense doesn't get enough credit. We did this to Syracuse's rushing attack. We did this to this. Like all these ACC defenses are better than people think. You think about these quarterbacks in this league. You know, like all this stuff. And I was like, I knew, I knew he was so upset about this. Like I, to- I knew it. Um, but no, so I think like that defense is going to be good. Keaton Slovis, I think will have a good year. Um, so I'm, I would, I, I'm going to ride with Pitt to, to repeat. I like that. All right. How about the Atlantic? Is your quarterback one of the conference going to be able to do it? Is he going to, is he going to win the division in the Atlantic? You know, again, I love great stories. I think NC state doing this would be a great story. So I'm going to say, yes, I'm going to say the Wolf Pack. Through the the wolf pack oh, are back. Look at that. I've got Everyone. the hat ready. It's back. Everyone's it's making its other appearance. Everyone's been picking NC State, so oh, Mac wait. has to have his hat ready. No, you can't change. No, 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 no I'm not going to no. change okay, it, but that's okay, absolutely okay. going to jinx them. This is a program that has jinxed before and it oh, yeah. before, so I'm a little worried about that. <laughs> uh, Dabo Sweeney is going to have firepower like none other. I can't <laughs> wait. I'm super excited. Okay, so so we've got the conference championship game. We've got Pitt. We've got NC State. Who's winning the ACC and eventually playing in the playoff? As you are going to tell us in. May, maybe a little bit of June here. I love how Mac just said, and, and they're going to make the playoff. playoff. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it is, whatever. Um, well, we'll see. I mean, it's very hard to predict, um, you know, wh- what other other leagues and their <laughs> champions are going to look like. You know what? Should we just, like, let's just go all in on NC State. It's an NC State week for me over here at The Athletic. The hat is ready. He's ready. Um, listen, like, one of the interesting things, and you guys know Dave Duran, you, you've talked to him. Dave Doran uh, loves to talk about how like NC State gets overlooked and things. Oh yeah. So he will. He, one of the things he was saying was, you know, Devin had this incredible season, but it takes two seasons for people sure. to realize. Sure. So NC State broke through in a lot of important ways last year. Got monkeys off the bat. The Clemson win, the way they beat North Carolina, and they didn't really get a ton of national respect, like right. in terms of what we're talking about, yeah. in terms of actually like winning the the league. So year two. This is it. I think I think they can do it. I think the league, again, we were talking about Clemson. I'm most interested in the transition for the coaching staff and the coordinators and some of this like lot bigger picture stuff. I think I think this is a year where the good ACC teams can win it. It's gettable. So yeah, I'll take NC State and um hopefully not curse them. This is now an NC State Wolfpack podcast. <laughs> Thank you everyone for listening. Uh Nicole, this is a lot of fun. Really appreciate you joining us. Uh, man, I, I can't wait to see the season play out. Me too. And uh, anytime you guys want me to come on, we uh, our wolf pack, whenever they have a good win, <laughs> I'm, I'm ready to ready to join the pod. Tell Red we say thank you for his appearance as well. I will. Hold on. I grab him one second. <laughs> he's, running, he's running away from me. He's running Red. away. Well, hey. Come on, Red. There you go. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks again to Nicole Auerbach for joining us, Mac. She is probably one of the most respected guests that we have had. I mean, she is just so well respected in this business and it was inspiring to hear her story. I knew she had been a quick riser. You can tell how smart she is if you just read her writing on The Athletic and you and you hear her on Sirius XM and all over the place. But to hear how she got there, I, I think no matter if you're going into journalism or you're going into any career, that is something that young professionals and college kids need to listen to. Her like 10 minute speech basically <laughs> where she gave us exactly what she did and how she differentiated herself was awesome. I I just wanted to, I think I did clap maybe afterwards, but I, I just felt like I didn't yeah. have anything. I didn't need to talk anymore because it was that good. So shout out to Nicole. What an inspiration. And 
Uh, just one of the best. Yeah, in the st- standing really the round of cover. applause for that. It, it was, it was, it got me jacked up. I mean, I was ready to go uh, when she was just going through all this. And and I love the the confidence and the self belief and, mm. and just you know kind of self awareness yes. that I did put in this work. Like, sure, there there was probably some luck along the way. Right. But as I said, as she said, as you say. You know, when opportunity and preparation, when they meet on that train track, I mean, it's some really cool stuff that can happen as evident, uh, you know, by what Nicole was just saying there. So that was my, it it was just fun. I hope everybody, like you said, listens to that because Mm -hmm. it's not just, I I luck into this thing. It takes hours and hours and days and years of of work to, to when you get to that moment. As she said, it was an internship. She wrote this crazy article, and people are like, "Whoa, you're not a full time writer. You don't do this, you know, professionally and get paid and all this stuff." So it, it's something where I, I think that everybody can relate to that. Everybody can relate to hard work and, and getting after it and yeah. understanding, you know, what they're doing. So really fun. Thank you so much, Nicole, again for coming on. But guys, that's it from us. Thank you for tuning in. Another great episode of Gramlick and Mac Lane. If you don't have the Sirius XM, if you don't have the app. Go get it right now. You can listen on your phone. You can listen in your car. Anywhere that you go, we can go with you. Doesn't that sound fun? Let's let's do that. We also need you guys to go over to YouTube, <laughs> go over to iTunes, follow, subscribe to our podcast and channel. We would greatly appreciate that. But until next time, we'll see y'all. <laughs>